Mr. Bluff's Experiences of Holidays by Oliver Bell Bunce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mr. Bluff's Experiences of Holidays I hate holidays, said Bachelor Bluff to me, with some little irritation on a Christmas a few years ago. Then he paused an instant, after which he resumed. I don't mean to say that I hate to see people enjoying themselves, but I hate holidays, nevertheless, because, to me, they are always the saddest and dreariest days of the year. I shudder at the name of holiday. I dread the approach of one, and thank heaven when it is over. I pass through on a holiday the most horrible sensations, the bitterest feelings, the most oppressive melancholy. In fact, I am not myself at holiday times. Very strange, I ventured to interpose. A plague on it, said he, almost with violence. I'm not inhuman. I don't wish anybody harm. I'm glad people can enjoy themselves. But I hate holidays all the same. You see, this is the reason. I am a bachelor. I am without kin. I am in a place that did not know me at birth. And so, when holidays come around, there is no place anywhere for me. I have friends, of course. I don't think I've been a very sulky, shut-in, reticent fellow, and there is many a board that has a place for me, but not at Christmas time. At Christmas the dinner is a family gathering, and I've no family. There is such a gathering of kindred on this occasion, such a reunion of family folk, that there is no place for a friend, even if the friend be liked. Christmas, with all its kindliness and charity and good will, is, after all, deuced selfish. Each little set gathers within its own circle, and people like me, with no particular circle, are left in the lurch. So, you see, on the day of all the days in the year that my heart pines for good cheer, I am without an invitation. "'Oh, it's because I pine for good cheer,' said the bachelor, sharply interrupting my attempt to speak, that I hate holidays. If I were an infernally selfish fellow, I wouldn't hate holidays. I'd go off and have some fun all to myself, somewhere, or somehow. But, you see, I hate to be in the dark when all the rest of the world is in light. I hate holidays because I ought to be merry and happy on holidays, and can't.' "'Don't tell me!' he cried, stopping the word that was on my lips. "'I tell you, I hate holidays. The shops look merry, do they, with their bright toys and their green branches? The pantomime is crowded with merry hearts, is it? The circus and the show are brimful of fun and laughter, are they? Well, they all make me miserable. I haven't any pretty-faced girls or bright-eyed boys to take to the circus or the show, and all the nice girls and fine boys of my acquaintance have their uncles or their granddads or their cousins to take them to those places. So, if I go, I must go alone. But I don't go. I can't bear the chill of seeing everybody happy and knowing myself so lonely and desolate. Confound it, sir! I have too much heart to be happy under such circumstances. I am too humane, sir. And the result is... I hate holidays. It's miserable to be out, and yet I can't stay at home, for I get thinking of Christmases past. I can't read. The shadow of my heart makes it impossible. I can't walk, for I see nothing but pictures through the bright windows and happy groups of pleasure-seekers. The fact is, I've nothing to do but to hate holidays. But will you not dine with me? Of course, I had to plead engagement with my own family circle, and I couldn't quite invite Mr. Bluff home that day, when Cousin Charles and his wife, and Sister Susan and her daughter, and three of my wife's kin had come in from the country, all to make a merry Christmas with us. I felt sorry, but it was quite impossible, so I wished Mr. Bluff a merry Christmas, and hurried homeward through the cold and nipping air. I did not meet Bachelor Bluff again until a week after Christmas of the next year, when I learned some strange particulars of what occurred to him after our parting on the occasion just described. I will let Bachelor Bluff tell his adventure for himself. I went to church, said he, and was as sad there as everywhere else. Of course, the evergreens were pretty, and the music fine, but all around me were happy groups of people who could scarcely keep down Merry Christmas, long enough to do reverence to Sacred Christmas. And nobody was alone but me. 
Every happy paterfamilias in his pew tantalized me, and the whole atmosphere of the place seemed so much better suited to everyone else than me, that I came away hating holidays worse than ever. Then I went to the play and sat down in a box all alone by myself. Everybody seemed on the best of terms with everybody else, and jokes and banter passed from one to another with the most good-natured freedom. Everybody but me was in a little group of friends. I was the only person in the whole theatre that was alone. And then there was such clapping of hands and roars of laughter and shouts of delight at all the fun going on upon the stage, all of which was rendered doubly enjoyable by everybody having somebody with whom to share and interchange the pleasure, that my loneliness got simply unbearable, and I hated holidays infinitely worse than ever. By five o'clock the holiday seemed so intolerable that I said I'd go and get a dinner. The best dinner the town could provide. A sumptuous dinner for one. A dinner with many courses, with wines of the finest brands, with bright lights, with a cheerful fire, with every condition of comfort. And I'd see if I couldn't for once extract a little pleasure out of a holiday. The handsome dining-room at the club looked bright, but it was empty. Who dines at this club on Christmas but lonely bachelors? There was a flutter of surprise when I ordered a dinner, and the few attendants were, no doubt, glad of something to break the monotony of the hours. My dinner was well served. The spacious room looked lonely, but the white snowy cloths, the rich window hangings, the warm tints of the walls, the sparkle of the fire in the steel grate, gave the room an air of elegance and cheerfulness, and then the table at which I dined was close to the window, and through the partly drawn curtains were visible centres of lonely cold streets with bright lights from many a window. It is true, but there was a storm, and snow began whirling through the street. I let my imagination paint the streets as cold and dreary as it would, just to extract a little pleasure by way of contrast from the brilliant room of which I was apparently sole master. I dined well, and recalled in fancy old, youthful Christmases, and pledged mentally many an old friend, and my melancholy was mellowing into a low, sad undertone, when, just as I was raising a glass of wine to my lips, I was startled by a picture at the window-pane. It was a pale, wild, haggard face, in a great cloud of black hair pressed against the glass. As I looked, it vanished. With a strange thrill at my heart, which my lips mocked with a derisive sneer, I finished the wine and set down the glass. It was, of course, only a beggar girl that had crept up to the window and stole a glance at the bright scene within, but still the pale face troubled me a little and threw a fresh shadow on my heart. I filled my glass once more with wine and was again about to drink when the face reappeared at the window. It was so white— so thin, with eyes so large, wild, and hungry-looking, and the black unkept hair, into which the snow had drifted, formed so strange and weird a frame to the picture, that I was fairly startled. Replacing untasted the liquor on the table, I rose and went close to the pane. The face had vanished, and I could see no object within many feet of the window. The storm had increased, and the snow was driving in wild gusts through the streets, which were empty, save here and there a hurrying wayfarer. The whole scene was cold, wild, and desolate, and I could not repress a keen thrill of sympathy for the child, whoever it was, whose only Christmas was to watch, in cold and storm, the rich banquet ungratefully enjoyed by the lonely bachelor. I resumed my place at the table— but the dinner was finished, and the wine had no further relish. I was haunted by the vision at the window, and began, with an unreasonable irritation at the interruption, to repeat with fresh warmth my detestation of holidays. One couldn't even dine alone on a holiday with any sort of comfort, I declared. On holidays one was tormented by too much pleasure on one side, and too much misery on the other. And then, I said, hunting for justification of my dislike of the day, how many other people are, like me, made miserable by seeing the fullness of enjoyment others possess? Oh, yes, I know, sarcastically replied the bachelor to a comment of mine. Of course all magnanimous, generous, and noble-souled people delight in seeing other people made happy, and are quite content to accept this vicarious felicity. 
"'But I, you see, and this dear little girl—' "'Dear little girl?' "'Oh, I forgot,' said Bachelor Bluff, blushing a little, in spite of a desperate effort not to do so. "'I didn't tell you. Well, it was so absurd. I kept thinking, thinking of the pale, haggard, lonely little girl on the cold and desolate side of the window-pane, and the overfed, discontented, lonely old bachelor on the splendid side of the window-pane, and I didn't get much happier thinking about it, I can assure you.' I drank glass after glass of the wine, not that I enjoyed its flavour any more, but mechanically, as it were, and with a sort of hope thereby to drown unpleasant reminders. I tried to attribute my annoyance in the matter to holidays, and so denounced them more vehemently than ever. I rose once in a while and went to the window, but could see no one to whom the pale face could have belonged. At last, in no very amiable mood, I got up, put on my wrappers, and went out, and the first thing I did was to run against a small figure crouching in the doorway. A face looked up quickly at the rough encounter, and I saw the pale features of the window-pane. I was very irritated and angry, and spoke harshly, and then, all at once, I am sure I don't know how it happened, but it flashed upon me that I, of all men— had no right to utter a harsh word to one oppressed with so wretched a Christmas as this poor creature was. I couldn't say another word, but began feeling in my pocket for some money, and then I asked a question or two. And then I don't quite know how it came about. "'Isn't it very warm here?' exclaimed a bachelor bluff, rising and walking about and wiping the perspiration from his brow. "'Well, you see,' he resumed nervously, it was very absurd, but I did believe the girl's story, the old story, you know, of privation and suffering, and just thought I'd go home with a brat and see if what she said was all true. And then I remembered that all the shops were closed and not a purchase could be made. I went back and persuaded the steward to put up for me a hamper of provisions, which the half-wild little youngster helped me carry through the snow, dancing with delight all the way. And isn't this enough?' "'Not a bit, Mr. Bluff. I must have the whole story.' "'I declare,' said Bachelor Bluff, "'there's no whole story to tell. A widow with children in great need, that was what I found. And they had a feast that night, and a little money to buy them a load of wood and a garment or two the next day. And they were all so bright and so merry and so thankful and so good, that when I got home that night I was mightily amazed that— Instead of going to bed sour at holidays, I was in a state of great contentment in regard to holidays. In fact, I was really merry. I whistled. I sang. I do believe I caught a caper. The poor wretches I had left had been so merry over their unlooked-for Christmas banquet that their spirits infected mine. And then I got thinking again. Of course, holidays had been miserable to me, I said. What right had a well-to-do lonely old bachelor, hovering wistfully in the vicinity of happy circles, when all about there were so many people as lonely as he, and yet oppressed with want? "'Good gracious!' I exclaimed. "'To think of a man complaining of loneliness with thousands of wretches yearning for his help and comfort, with endless opportunities for work and company, with hundreds of pleasant and delightful things to do, just to think of it! It put me in a great fury at myself to think of it.' I tried pretty hard to escape from myself, and began inventing excuses and all that sort of thing, but I rigidly forced myself to look squarely at my own conduct, and then I reconciled my confidence by declaring that, if ever after that day I hated a holiday again, might my holidays end at once and for ever. Did I go and see my protégés again? What a question! Why, well, no matter. If the widow is comfortable now, it is because she has found a way to earn without difficulty enough for her few wants. That's no fault of mine. I would have done more for her, but she wouldn't let me. But just let me tell you about New Year's, the New Year's Day that followed the Christmas I've been describing. It was lucky for me there was another holiday only a week off. Bless you! I had so much to do that day I was completely bewildered, and the hours weren't half long enough. I did make a few social calls, but then I heard them over and then hastened to my little girl, whose face had already caught a touch of colour, and she, looking quite handsome in her new frock and her ribbons, took me to other poor folk, and, well, that's about the whole story. So, as to the next Christmas, well, I didn't dine alone, as you may guess. It was up three stairs, that's true, and there was none of that elegance that marked the dinner of the year before, but it was merry and happy and bright. It was a generous, honest, hearty Christmas dinner. 
that it was, although I do wish the widow hadn't talked so much about the mysterious way Turkey had been left at her door the night before. And Molly, that's the little girl, and I had a rousing appetite. We went to church early, then we had been down to the five points to carry the poor outcasts there something for their Christmas dinner. In fact, we had done wonders of work, and Molly was in high spirits, and so the Christmas dinner was a great success. "'Dear me, sir, no! Just as you say, holidays are not in the least wearisome any more. Plague on it! When a man tells me now that he hates holidays, I find myself getting very wroth. I pin him by the buttonhole at once and tell him my experience. The fact is, if I were at dinner on a holiday and anybody should ask me for a sentiment, I should say, God bless all holidays!' End of Mr. Bluff's Experience of Holidays by Oliver Bell Bunce.